These are the new style of questions that were not tested on the previous practices, and they are harder and more complicated. And if you see these for the first time on your next SAT, you're gonna be like, I haven't seen these before and it's gonna get pretty awkward. So today we're gonna quickly go over what these look like, what to expect and how you can solve them quickly and easily so you can score higher on your next SAT. So here's what the first question looks like. And as always guys, all the questions we're gonna go over today, plus the link to the key concepts you need to have for each of these questions are going to be nicely organized into a PDF, which you can download using the link in the pinned comment. And throughout the video, I highly recommend you print it out and try it with me because that's how you get better on the SAT, not by watching other people solve it on YouTube. So the first question says, which of the following have exactly one solution with the linear equation shown above right here? So from the start, we know that we're working with one linear equation and then two linear equations. And when it comes to two lines plus the number of intersections, you have to use what's known as the matching rule. And this is how matching rule works. And how the matching rule works is that by looking at the relationship between x, y, and number for the two equations, you can figure out exactly how many solutions these two lines will have. So let's take a look at x's. We have 3x and 3x. The relationship is going to be times 1 minus 6y, minus 6y, again, times 1, and 9 and 18 is going to be times 2. And you see how the relationship for the x's and the y's are matching with 1 and 1, but the number portion is different? Well, x and y is matching, but the number is different. That means you have zero solutions or zero intersections between the two lines. And because we're looking for one with one intersection or one solution, choice A is going to be out. And we do the same thing for choice B, C, and D. If you go to the second one, it's going to be minus 3x, minus 3x. It's going to be times minus 1, 6y times minus 1, and then 9 is going to be just times 1. Again, x and y matching, numbers different. That means it's going to have zero solution like the one above. We have 3x minus 3x is going to be times minus 1, minus 6y plus 6y times minus 1, 9 and minus 9 is going to be times minus 1. For this one, all three of them are matching, which means all three of them are matching. It's going to be here, here, and here, which means you're going to have infinite number of solutions. So that one is going to be out. If we look at the last one, it's going to be times 2 here, times 1 here, and then times 1 here. And here we have y and the number matching, y and the number matching, but x is different, which means we're going to have one solution. So our answer is going to be choice D. And the matching rule is very popular on the SAT. They usually gave you two equations on the top and asked you how many solutions are there, but this is the new style of question you want to be familiar with. If you're not sure how matching rule works, click the link here for a full guide. Let's go to the next question. The question says triangle A, B, C, and D, E, F have a measure of 37 and 75, which the following is sufficient to determine the two triangles are going to be congruent. So in the old SATs, they were mainly testing you on the similarity, what proves similarity between two triangles. But nowadays they're testing you more on the congruency between two triangles. And you wanna know how it works and what the requirements are to make these triangles congruent. And the very first thing we're gonna do for all of these geometry questions is to visualize and draw out because you gotta have some visuals. So we have triangle ABC and then DEF, which is going to be same thing right here because they arranged it the same way like that. And we know that the angle A and D measures what? It's going to be 37 here. And then B and E is going to have 75 degrees right there. And which of the following is enough to prove that these two triangles are congruent? Well, congruent triangles means they are identical triangles. They have same set of angles and same length for all three sides. And you want to memorize this. It's going to be side, angle, side, angle, side, angle, 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 side, and side, side, side. If you know one of these four things, then you can say, oh, these two triangles are going to be congruent. They are identical triangles. You probably have seen this at some point, but here's how it works. Let's look at choice A, the length of side A, B, and E, F. So if we know A, B, and E, F, where do we know? We have A, B, and E, F. Unfortunately, this is not gonna work because these two parts are from the different sides of the triangle. In triangle one, it's going to be on this side, but on triangle two, it's going to be on a different side. So choice A is not going to work. If that's a little confusing, just hang in there with me. It's gonna click in a few seconds. Let's look at choice B, the measure of angle C and F. So C and F is gonna be right there. And for this one, it's gonna be the same location for both triangles. But now we only know angle, 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 and angle, angle, angle is not one of the requirements. So choice B is going to be out. Let's look at choice C, side length of AC and DF. So if we know AC and DF, and requirement wise, it's gonna be angle, angle, side. And we know that angle, angle, side is one of the requirements for congruency. So that's sufficient information to prove congruency between two triangles. 
Does that make sense? So the main takeaway from this question is that when it comes to proving congruency, you only have two requirements, and that is you have to have one of these four requirements right there, and you have to make sure they come from the same corner or same sides. And more importantly, and also when it comes to proving similarity between two triangles, you either have to know all the angles between the two triangles, or you have to know that the side length are going to be proportional for all three sides. You definitely want to understand the difference between the two because SAT will ask you for what's similar and what is congruent. But if you're not sure what the differences are, just click the link over here and it's going to take you to a full guide. And now the next type of question you want to be familiar with looks something like this. And it's going to tell you that this is a solution to the equation. What's the value of A? And to get a better understanding of this question, it literally comes down to just visualizing what's going on. What do we have? We have a parabola because we have two over here and it probably looks something like that. And we are looking for solution to the equation shown above. So what exactly is the solution to the equation shown above here? We're looking for value of X that would make our Y value equal to zero. And on the graph, Y equals to zero is going to be right here. And the value of X that makes it happen for the graph is going to be right there. And these points are known as roots for a parabola, also known as the X intercepts. And when it comes to a parabola, there are two ways in which you can find them for the SAT. First one is going to be factoring. Second one is going to be the quadratic formula. And what you want to do is you look at this equation right here. And if you can factor this, then you use factoring and get a structure that looks something like that. But if it cannot be factored, then you use what's known as the quadratic formula and your answer is going to have a radical in there somewhere, which involves a radical. And if you look at the question carefully, it says, this over here is solution to the equation. That means that is going to be the x-intercepts of this parabola right here. And what do you see? We see radical in the solution. We see radical in the x-intercepts. And that means this equation is not going to be factorable. So that means in order for us to find the solution for this parabola over here, we're not going to factor. Instead, we're going to go with the quadratic formula. So if we pop it in, we're going to get minus b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac over 2a which simplifies to minus three plus or minus 17 over two, which can be written as minus three over two plus or minus 17 over two. And if we just flip the location, we're going to get root 17 over two minus three over two, which matches what we are provided in the question. So our value of A is going to be what? It's just going to be 17. That is going to be our answer. So the main takeaway from this question is understanding how to put the pieces together and then realize that, oh, I'm looking for x-intercept in this question. And second, more importantly, whenever you're working with a parabola and you're looking for x-intercepts and it involves radical, then don't even think about factoring, go straight into quadratic formula because the moment the radical shows up, it's not gonna be factorable. And that's a quick SAT pattern you wanna have in your head. And if you're not sure how what just happened, just click that link right there. And let's go to the last question. The question says, which of the following is equivalent form of the expression shown above right here? And as I mentioned previously, Whenever the SAT says find equivalent form, that just means to simplify, not simp, simplify the equation shown above. And the whole idea of fractional exponents where you convert exponents into radicals and vice versa has been very popular. If you're not sure, click the link over here, but here's how it works. And if you look at the answer choices, we see that, okay, there weren't radicals before, but now all the choices have radicals. Your final answer has to involve some kind of radical and that's where the fractional exponent comes in. It's where you have to convert fractional exponents into radicals and vice versa. And that wasn't very popular on the old SATs, but now it's getting even more and more popular. And here's exactly what you need to know. So this three fourth over here is getting applied to X squared Y. So X squared Y is going to be your base and X squared Y is going to be your base. And then you put a hat over it. You put a radical over it. And you want to look at this fraction carefully. What's at the bottom? The denominator is going to be the number that sits outside of your radical. And the number that sits on the top, the numerator, is going to be the exponent for whatever is on the inside. And now if you just simplify that, we're going to get quad root of x to the sixth and y to the third power. Quad root, there are six of them. So one of them can exit. It's going to be x. And according to the quadrant, we need four of the same thing for it to exit. Right now for X, we have six of them. So we can have one X exit and we're going to be left with two X's and then Y to the third power. That's going to be our answer. Our answer is choice A. But wait, there's more. This is the first version of the conversion. There's another type you need to be familiar with where instead of the three going on the inside, the three is now going to go on the outside like so. And that is where these answer choices come in. And from my experience going over hundreds of SATs, 
The second version was only tested like once or twice, and the first version was the more popular one, but it wouldn't hurt for you to be prepared with the second version just in case it shows up. And all in all, you have to understand how to convert fractional exponents into radicals and then go the opposite direction, going from radical into fractional exponents. And if you're not sure how to do that, just click the link over here for a full guide. And these are the four new types, but there are these four OG types of questions that show up on the every single SAT. You can learn everything about it by watching this video right here.